we'll be working on some commissions today, some illustration commissions. I have a client that I live illustrated for, and they want to use two of my illustrations of their building and of their shoes on their website and um, on their social media. They want me to film it as well, so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm hoping to finish it today because it's a really last minute job and they need it on Wednesday, it's now Monday. So there's not really room for error, but also the illustrations aren't that uh, detailed, so I should be able to do them today. Um, and then I hope I have the footage ready and I can edit it and send it out. All right, that was an intense session of drawing. What I'm gonna do now is scan them in and look at them on my digital screen, clean them up a little bit, send them to the client and see if they have any things that they want to change, like small corrections, because I included one round of corrections in the price. And if they don't, then that's great, because then I can send them right away. Photo Merge is uh, a feature in Photoshop that you can use to stitch together scans because I don't have an A3 scanner, but I do often paint for clients on A3 size. I've even stitched together huge paintings. Hello, good morning. I had a very productive day yesterday. And this is the second time I'm recording this because my audio wasn't working. I finished a client project yesterday and I'm waiting for feedback on that. Uh, if It's the second round of feedback already, so if that gets back, then I know it's done. If you see it in the video, then you know that it's been approved <laughs> and I can show it to you guys. Uh, there's this other thing that I've been wanting to do as well. Oh, that's a lot of hair. That's because I am working on this project with a charity and I'm going to make one piece of art about a certain theme that they're working on right now. The funds that I earn from that are all directly going to that charity. But I kind of have to get into a certain headspace for that because it's not just like it's it's a very sensitive topic and I don't always feel like that. So that's something I'm keeping maybe for the rest of the day or maybe tomorrow or the day after. I normally don't share that much on social issues or things that go on in the world but this time uh, I'll be making something for Art Collective for Peace. They want to use art as a way to connect with people about war everything that's going on in Gaza. This is the first project that they're focusing on because they just started out, but it's going to be about different things going on in the world. It could also be in the future about climate, for example, but this project is focused on Gaza. I will be making one original piece, um, probably a work on paper that is going to be sold for the charity that they picked. And right now they picked a charity that focuses on children trauma and they are very active in helping those children overcome this, those traumas that, that were caused because of war. There will also be a print released and that will be from the original. So that print will have an addition and 100% of all the proceeds will be raised for that charity so that they can 
use it as much as possible. I wanted to make something especially with Gaza in mind with the news articles. Um, I honestly don't read the news anymore because it's just bad news all over and I'm too emotional to just absorb all that bad news every day so I just don't anymore. Obviously I keep up to date once in a while but um, I noticed that I was kind of looking up to that point of gathering information for an image. The way my work works is that I already put my inspiration and the things that I'm noticing in the world in my work, even though it's subconsciously. So there's this work that I made that I think might fit this cause really well. And I know that I didn't put any force on the subject instead of making something completely new because it's just all bad news. and I. I don't want to hide myself from that bad news, but I did feel that there was some sort of thing that was stopping me from delving into that work, and that's why I've been pushing it forward. So it's, it's, it's going to be not something directly inspired by, but something that is something that is beautiful in another way. And the reason that I thought of this piece was actually because it is really introspective and it's really looking downwards. Um, it's hard to explain because I just made it and I can always see why I made something a lot clearer um, a few months after, but this obviously is a bit more um, right next to each other. So. But I can, I, 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 this is the piece that I thought of and sometimes it's just really subconscious, um, but it makes sense. This print and the original are now available via Art Collective for Peace. There was a lot of work sold on the day of their launch event, which was great. I also live illustrated there and I made a lot of drawings. People could donate money as much as they wanted. And the founder of the charity that they picked to donate money from was also speaking, which was very impressive. If you want to grab a print from them and all the proceeds will go to charity. I was looking at the last studio vlog and cleaning my brushes and thinking this is not okay. We need to do something about it. So the next day I ran to the store and I made myself some brush dip. A little bit different from the one I found online because I couldn't find the exact ingredients. But so far I've been using it for a few weeks and it's been working for me. It's a mix of safflower oil and some lavender brush cleaner. Um, the one that I saw online was safflower oil with 2% clove oil, but that 
they didn't have that in the store. So it's just a mix that I keep in a closed container. And as soon as I am finished with painting, I wipe up most of the oil that is on there and then dip it in the brush dip. And I can leave them for a few weeks. At least for now, I've tried it for a few weeks and it's been working. Did you know I have a Patreon? This video is not sponsored by a company, but by my patrons. We have a lovely little community of other artists and people that want to support the channel that are not necessarily artists. You don't have to be an artist, but most of them are. And we have a work in progress chat where we share our working progresses. We did a Zoom a few weeks ago, which was really fun because I met most people that are supporting my work and are learning with me. And I teach art lessons on there, which you can all watch back. There are currently 22 lessons on there, all of them between 20 minutes and an hour. And I also share my own work in progresses there and especially the works that are not out yet and that I want to protect because they're pretty fragile. I love sharing it with my little community instead of with hundreds or thousands. So if you want to check that out, go to the link in the description and it's very much appreciated because these videos take a lot of time to make and honestly, without your support, it's pretty impossible. Thank you for listening to this little sponsored by Patreon break. I finished the book finally. It's called Stuck on the Platform and I've actually talked about it earlier on um, in a long thoughts video talking about platforms. Um, I've been reading a lot of non-fiction lately and this is one of the first that I picked up. I have a collection right now that I need to get through. But it took me some time to finish it because I only read it in the studio. If you read a lot of informational non-fiction, you kind of need to do it in parts because otherwise all the information is just going to be gone in your head. It's just too much. But what I liked about this book is that 
Uh, I think the first half is really strong and then there's like some chapters that are less interesting because it was written in I think 2021 so it was still during Covid and obviously there's some Zoom stuff in there, some Covid related problems on the internet, uh, on platforms. Those things aside, as well as the crypto and the NFTs that they're talking about, I think it's really interesting because it's talking about this next step of the internet and how no one can even imagine a different internet and a world without big platforms like Facebook or Meta, um, stuff like that. And I think we are at this turning point, like it's gonna be very slow and also very fast at the same time. I mean, after this book came out, like AI suddenly was there and that took like two years to completely <laughs> blow everyone mi everyone's mind. He also talks about an alternative and if that means everyone needs to leave, uh, if that means there should be an alternative first that's being made by the people instead of big corporations and also about how that worked out for NFTs because it was supposed to be an open thing where artists would be paid for their work but then other people stepped in and now it's just as gate capped and you're kind of back at square one. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting read because it, it's like it's in my mind a lot, obviously like my work, half of it, maybe 75% of it is online and it's great that what the internet can bring, but I'm feeling this shift happening and I don't know what's coming next, but I do think it's fascinating to read about what could be next. It's, it's, there's, there's topics in, the, in this book that I haven't heard about yet, uh, like stacks, uh, is a whole chapter which half of it was too much for me but it's basically about having platforms be more social uh, like a Wikipedia like it's everyone can contribute to that platform like not everyone can contribute to the making of the internet because everyone has their own layer the theory that he's talking about is the next step for the internet the next step for platforms that it could be something like a Wikipedia, that not the users don't just see like the upper layer. Uh, he, he uses the example of the apps, but there's that they can also access the middle part and the lower part and they can change pretty much anything. And I don't know if that will work, but I do think it's an interesting theory to discuss. Yeah, I'm, I have some more nature-like books on the planning after this because this is very digital. Um, but once in a while I do really like to read something like this. So yeah, definitely recommendation. We are almost at the end of the footage, but I thought it would be fun to show you a little bit of how I make a life illustration, because they're very fast. This one is made in about five minutes, and it's a sample for the event for Art Collective for Peace. I hadn't done live portraits in a while, so I always like to warm up and time myself before I go if I haven't done it in a little while. So that's what you see me do. The picture is just some random um, image I found on Pinterest as I have to use some sort of reference for this because I have actual people sitting in front of me at one of those events. So what I kind of do is I pick some materials that are quick. In this case, I use acrylic ink and Ecoline and watercolor pencils. And I make some sort of tint on the paper. In this case, it's going to be blue and green because the brand colors of Art Collective are blue, green and purple. And I really like those colors together. And in that way, I am also not stuck with brown hair color and skin tones 
all the time. <laughs> it can get a little bit repetitive. So this way, I kind of give myself a little bit more extra uh, creative freedom. So I tint the paper with some pretty random color. And then I go in with my pencils to sketch the outside of the face as well as an eye. Because I think with those first few lines, you can kind of grab someone's likeness right away. And if you don't have that likeness, <laughs> you have the other half of the drawing to fix it and make sure that it does look a little bit more alike. So that's kind of how I start out. Then I kind of intuitively grab some other colored pencils and then I go in with some darker colors to actually paint the hair. Sometimes I actually paint the hair first by the way because it frames the face for some people a lot more. Kind of depends on who's sitting in front of me and what kind of characteristics are most noticeable about them. I love drawing the eyes and putting a little bit more extra attention to them. However, they are a little bit hard to grab a likeness to because if I have time in a studio, I have endless time, but if I'm sitting in front of someone, I only have those five minutes. So every line that's wrong could end up taking another minute or another two minutes. And I don't really want that. So I do add some extra attention to the eyes, but I try to not overwork them. Then the lips are, I feel like sometimes they're underrated, but you really need to <laughs> pay attention to the lips because if you get them wrong, it changes someone's complete expression. What I do at the end is I think the fun part because people can see me drawing and most people wear some kind of accessory, whether it's piercings, whether it's earrings or a necklace or some sweater that they that is has a very uh, interesting texture. Um, I leave those for last because then it all comes together and most people are like, oh, it really look like this drawing and it kind of gives this wow effect. And because I like to have some creativity in these drawings. I always put my own twist to it and not mind as much if there are things that are incomplete because I kind of like those things. So obviously if I'm drawing 50 portraits in a day, it's going to end up a little bit different than if I'm drawing 10 a day or 15 a day, which is pretty, um, pretty average. And not all of them are gonna be my best work yet. However, I do try to um, pay attention to the people that I'm drawing. So I know that at least I have some of their likeness in them and they go home happy.